But Steffi, thank you so, so much. Augusta, thank you so, so much. I'm sure I'm going to butcher some names tonight, so I'm sorry. I'm so grateful for being here and so grateful for being invited, so thank you very much. I'm bound to make some mistakes. I spend most of my life communicating with fish through a mask and frogs through a camera, so please forgive me if I make mistakes. E.O. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> e. Wilson, the naturalist, author, and father of conservation biology, said, every species is a masterpiece exquisitely adapted to the particular environment in which it has survived. Who are we to destroy or even diminish biodiversity? Jane Goodall speaks of the tapestry of life with millions of ecosystems around the world, each one a complex web of interacting species. An associate thinks of biodiversity as a gigantic machine where every species is a cog, and every time a cog is lost, the machine works a little less well. What more delightful aspect of nature is there? An elixir, the wondrous miracle of life on Earth. For me, this resource is everything. All vibrant colors and forms in the kaleidoscope, from the preposterous looking giraffe beetle to the diadem sifaka and red-eyed tree frog with blue and yellow sides, green back, red eyes, and orange feet. We have identified approximately 1.2 million species on Earth, but some scientists estimate that up to 8.7 million species exist. I think sometimes we get lost in the numbers, and I find it easier to focus on the individual. Every single animal is different, a personality with different strengths, weaknesses, and abilities. They manifest different behaviors and moods often in the same day. A whale, for example, can be very shy or stressed and avoid all swimmers in the morning, and then relax and become extremely sociable in the afternoon. Some turtles might swim with you, three meters or less from your side, for 45 minutes, trusting you and allowing you into their world, where others will panic at the sight of a bubble from 40 meters away and vanish in the blink of an eye. <clears throat> There is no explaining why some animals behave so differently to others or alternate character traits at different times. Charles Darwin said that the love for all living creatures is the most noble attribute of man. David Attenborough says he knows of no pleasure deeper than that which comes from contemplating the natural world and trying to understand it. So let's be noble and find pleasure together. Experience, for example, posing pumas in Patagonia. An unexpected gentleman's club of lounging lions in Tanzania. A cheetah cub that appears catatonic. Jaded jaguars, cute capybaras, kingfishers, and catfish-craving caimans in Brazil's Pantanal. Resplendent hummingbirds in Ecuador and blue darkness in Brazil. Orangutans in Borneo, which are now so rare we should be ashamed of ourselves, some of which can be seen at the top of soul standing trees in their devastated environments, incredulous about the fate that befalls them. The clown triggerfish, who hasn't quite, up, quite made up his mind what color he wants to be, and whose parents clearly gave him the unfortunate name Balistoides conspicilum. An emperor angelfish that might just see itself as Caesar, <clears throat> you might experience an unexpected swim with busy, social, strangely attractive pilot whales in Dominica. Pilot whales are known to occasionally gather around ships and actually behave like pilots, directing captain and crew alike. These magnificent, family-oriented, fast animals accepted my buddy Ollie and me into their pod for twice 15 minutes, swimming slowly enough for us to keep up with them but fast enough to tell my meniscus it was becoming roshti and kaput. Occasionally, one finds oneself trying to fit between the sand and infinitely fragile coral to observe the outlandish-looking tasseled wobbegong, a carpet shark. One out of over 500 species of shark, or 1071 species of cartilaginous fish, if you include skates and rays. With the Wabagongs in Raja Ampat, one of the two most biodiverse places in the world, 
one can nearly always find diminutive, formation-changing glass fish it overhangs in the reef. While Bergongs aside, the glassy situation in Egypt is essentially identical. I couldn't, in this brief survey of the seven seas and shrinking habitats, neglect bumphead parrotfish, with males competing by bumping their hard heads together, which parade the reef in large organized schools, grazing on coral and leaving a trail of sand behind them. Pictured here is a couple that stayed around a coral bommy, a lovely sight in its own right, feeding with glee a few meters from my group, apparently unperturbed by our invasion of their privacy. Sometimes you enter a dreamy, idyllic location and witness a divine sight where the light seems to shine down from the heavens directly onto your subject, the object of your affection. <clears throat> An example might be these spinner dolphins in Sataya, a five kilometer reef in the middle of the Red Sea. A magical, critically endangered hawksbill turtle basking in the light hugging the reef, surrounded by Antheus at St. John's. A whale shark, the biggest fish in the sea, reaching up to 18 meters in shards of Mexican light. A boto, belonging to one of four or five freshwater dolphin species, sitting on the sand in Manaus. Pink dolphins whose existence itself is hard to believe, and also threatened, as evidenced by a hundred of them found dead recently, because the water was too hot. In Tonga in 2015, it was this incredible, incredibly bonded and synchronized mum and calf, which appeared to actually emanate the light themselves. <clears throat> in La Ventana last March in Mexico, it was a raft of rascally sea lions. Occasionally, you might have the highest honor bestowed on you as a humpback whale calf circles you repeatedly and bumps your leg painlessly before it says a slow motion goodbye and returns to the depths. Or when a delightful sperm whale calf allows you to approach it for minutes at the surface and then move all around its face to take photograph after photograph before it sinks a few meters below you and hangs completely immobile, reminding you that sperm whales who live in matriarchal societies sleep head to the sky and tail to the depths slumbering for only 15 to 25 minutes at a time. A needy, gigantic leviathan in Morea a month ago came right up to swimmers and spy hopped next to the boat repeatedly, telling us that interspecies communion was required. <clears throat> Observe the cartoonish face of a blue shark in Mexico or have a manta ray show you its belly time after time. <clears throat> All these moments and creatures change you, and they remind us that we are not alone, that there is beauty, intelligence, purpose, and a myriad life forms all around us. I'm sad to share that, as Cousteau said, water and air, the two essential fluids on which all life depends, have become global garbage cans. Plastic production is set to increase fourfold by 2050, and plastic has been found in the gut of virtually every marine organism. We ourselves are consuming about a credit card's worth of plastic every week, and plastic enters babies directly through their mother's placentas. A recent study has shown that we have increasing levels of plastic in our brains. It enters our bodies directly from the millions of bottles of water that we drink. About, this is very depressing, by the way, so apologies. About a third of all shark and cetacean species are at risk of extinction, as are six out of seven species of sea turtle. There's been a 69% decline in species populations since 1970. We've pushed the extinction rate to between 1,000 and 10,000 times what it was in pre-industrial days. In 2020, about a third of the Pantanal was burned by fire, and this year looks worse. A highly degraded Amazon could become a net producer of carbon rather than a carbon sink. Incredibly diverse, important coral reefs, which cover less than 1% of the seafloor, are being wiped out by warming waters, and we could lose up to 90% of what remains by 2050, 
I hope my figures are right, because a lot of people know more than I do here. I just heard people who had different figures, so hopefully I'm okay. Um, let us not forget that coral reefs and rainforests are by far the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. A staggering 80% of the world's documented species can be found in tropical rainforests. And some estimate that there are 830,000 species living on coral reefs worldwide. In fact, a fifth of all marine species depend on coral reefs for at least one stage of their lives. No species has less of a right to live here than we do. Back to E.O. Wilson. He told us that every scrap of biological diversity is priceless, to be learned and cherished, and never to be surrendered without a struggle. And that destroying rainforests for economic gain is like burning a Renaissance painting to cook a meal. Jane Goodall asserts that while we think, thank you, Jane Goodall <clears throat> asserts that while we think we're the most intelligent species on the planet, we're also the only one dumb enough to destroy its own habitat. Sylvia Earle, recognizing the destruction we have inflicted, says that whilst things may never before have been this bad, we've never been in a better position to fix things. And she says nature bounces back if you allow it to. The good news is that we basically managed to put an end to whaling, and we largely solved the ozone problem. We identify 15 to 18,000 new species a year. Slowly but surely, we are finding alternatives to plastic. People have identified the more heat-resistant corals and are learning to grow them. Renewable energy and carbon capture technology are developing apace. It's now a matter of massively scaling up. So what can we do? Marine protected areas work. One of them, Cabo Pulmo in Mexico, experienced a 400% increase in biomass just a few years after its establishment. Probably the best option we have to protect biodiversity and slow species loss is to work with local communities to buy land and conserve entire ecosystems, hundreds or thousands of species at a time where large chunks of forest or other habitats can't be bought or fully protected, we can establish corridors that allow animals more freedom, opportunity to feed and breed. Science and technology are moving at warp speed and must be harnessed if we are to turn things around. Well-educated, willing, and spirited youths will be inspired change agents. Education, awareness, and information dissemination are, in my opinion, absolutely key. Why would you protect something you don't care about or change if you don't know you need to? And how can you repair something if you don't understand why or how it's broken? We can and should establish and strengthen regulations and make the consequences of ignoring them more onerous. We can elect more credible, intelligent, and responsible leaders and perhaps vote out, for example, politicians who are climate change deniers, whose children are trophy hunters, or who, or who give no thought to cutting down the Amazon. We must wean ourselves off fossil fuels and do all that we can do to banish plastic from our lives. In our crisis-laden situation, in the face of such adversity and confronted with such a bleak possible future, I think it is our moral imperative to fight, to grit our teeth, sweat, bleed, and give it our all, just as Mother Nature has herself given us everything we have. But we should be under no convenient illusion. Whilst we once needed nature to live, nature now depends entirely on us merely to survive. Thank you very much. Get a mic and you don't. I think I get 
<laughs> Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dear Hossein, please, my apologies for this unfortunate <laughs> introduction <laughs> just now. Oh, please. And um, there was some perfect. miscommunication, and I was um, in panic to say something wrong, so <laughs> I thought it was better not to say anything. Um, nice. But I I'm absolutely love what you're doing. I love your work. Thank you so much you to coming here to Bavaria to present it. And you heard the applause of the audience interrupting your speech. Yeah. I think the reason for that is that one, one can sense immediately when you're speaking that this is very much, it comes from your heart. You're doing it because you're completely it convinced. It does, yeah, it really does. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's the highest honor and I'm so grateful. Thank you, thank you. Really. <laughs> so pleased thank to be you. here. I think this will be a very powerful conference here that mm. Steffi is hopefully mm. repeating to Thank raise you. much more awareness for the biodiversity crisis and, yeah. and for all the big challenges we are facing. Right. Um, I, um, I think there's one, um, one thing that struck me if I, I see your work. Um, I, I read your book, Encount Marine Encounters, and I love it, and I also... Right. I, looked at the pictures in your other exhibitions right. and it, it, it becomes very clear that, uh, to me, it's very clear that these are, you're sharing very prime, private um, moments, moments mm -hmm. very private moments and um, when, I think you're doing that on purpose to engage people emotionally. Yeah, yeah. very much. I think if you don't see something, see how incredible it is, experience the intelligence and the rest, you're not going to care enough about it necessarily to try and help it or protect it. So that's one of the things, it's just educating people, raising awareness, showing them what's out there and why, should, why we should protect it. So raising awareness is really one of the key things we can do to make a change. That was a very clear message. Yeah. And um, I think that's also a, a share, a mission that we share. Yeah. Steffi um, promoted Biotopia just before the mm. Natural History mm. Museum in Bavaria. Mm. The, the, funnily enough, the, the mission of, of the museum is to reconfigure the relationship between humans and other species. Right. So it will be a, a, it will be a museum f about life Right. But much more than a museum, it, should, it will become a platform for science communication and education and engaging people with the topics that matter most in right. our times. So right. the whole, whole spectrum of life sciences right. and environmental sciences. Fantastic. And I very much hope that this museum will open soon so that we can host you here again. I would and love then that. Thank you. I'd love that then continue to engage people with, with nature. I would love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here, really.